The next chapter with Prim's Ripipad is a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, everybody, it's Prim. Welcome to the next chapter presented by Baron Davis and Slick Studios. This week's guest is a veteran on the professional tennis circuit and a top 20 doubles player, Rohan Bopana. So Rohan has been on the ATP tour forever, almost 20 years now. His highest singles ranking was 213 in the world, but his area of expertise is undoubtedly in doubles. Over the course of his career, he's won over 400 tour-level doubles matches and 22 career titles, including the 2017 French Open in mixed doubles. And his highest doubles ranking was three in the world. And today, at the young age of 42, Rohan continues to travel all over the globe, making a fantastic living playing tennis. Now, I recognize most of my guests are typically of the retired fashion, but this show is not just about athletes and their transition from sport. It's about their journey in sport and how those experiences shape who they become as people. And because I haven't had a ton of active athletes who are still playing and competing, I thought it would be really, really interesting to bring someone on who is in the final chapter of their career and talk to them in real time about how they are preparing for this phase. Heading into this interview, I was also really curious to hear how Rohan has been processing the recent retirement of some of his peers, including Serena Williams and Roger Federer. I mean, within a span of several months, we saw two of the greatest tennis players of all time walk away. And as this era comes to a close, I wondered, does retirement somehow become easier when people around you, also two legends in the game, does it become more doable when you see them doing it? And you'll get to hear Rohan's answer to that. And you'll also notice me peppering him with tons of questions about what it's going to be like for him to leave tennis, to say goodbye, and to enter that next chapter. In many ways, I wanted to see if me just asking him tons of questions on this sometimes very difficult topic could somehow get him thinking and preparing for this inevitable transition whenever that time comes. And because that's something that To be honest, no one really did for me. And I want athletes and coaches and parents to know what questions they should be asking themselves and answering during what is often a very confusing and challenging period as athletes are preparing for retirement or their next phase. So without further ado, here's Rohan Bopana. Since it's 9.30 over there, I know it is around your bedtime. And for me, being an old lady, I go to bed at 7.30. So let's get the interview underway. Um, I usually start things off with a nice warm-up. You know, you and I, both tennis players, we like a nice little warm-up. So we're going to do a little rapid fire. Are you ready? All right, let's do it. (laughs) Okay. Three words that describe you as an athlete. Uh, Perseverance. Uh, hard work Mm -hmm. and uh, I think enjoying wow that's nice yeah that's really good Uh, favorite sport growing up cricket because I think it was just so much uh, shown in uh, India I think that uh, was the easiest access to the sport uh, wherever I went to so yeah cricket that makes sense. How about favorite athlete growing up? Sorry, I, uh, I just keep, I missed you there. Favorite athlete growing up? Uh, Stefan Edberg. I think, uh, you know, when I, where I was growing up, uh, the only tennis tournament was shown was Wimbledon. Hmm. And Edberg and Becker had a s- strong rivalry back then. And uh, I just liked uh, Stefan Edberg's personality. And I think he was my favorite athlete. Maybe that's why you became a double specialist because you copied your game a little bit after Edberg and Becker a little bit. 
Uh, I think back then everybody served in Wallid and kind of. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I think when I was really starting out, that was the only option, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, your strength as an athlete. Not giving up, I think. How about your weakness as an athlete? Food. <laughs> that could be deemed no, as, as a strength, like, but how is that your weakness? Because sometimes it's not as healthy as as it should be. <laughs> that's why I, that's what I meant. I, I meant in terms of not eating the right kind of food. So that kind of you know doesn't help. That's it. You've been you're what you're into your forties and still playing. You must be doing something right. Okay, favorite or best moment as an athlete. Uh, I think the first day I represented uh, India at the Davis Cup. I think, uh, you know, even 20 years later, I'm still representing. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but, uh, you know, <laughs> the minute I play for India, I think that's, that, that some is definitely uh, a fantastic feeling. Yeah. yeah, representing and playing for your country. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Yeah, funniest absolutely. moment as an athlete. Do you have a funniest moment or embarrassing moment? Oh, I think there are plenty, plenty, uh, <laughs> you know, of uh, uh, so many times uh, when I come to the U.S., a lot of, uh, lot of people come to me and say, can I take a selfie? I've watched you play everything. You're doing so good. Uh, you know, you're... Uh, uh, you know, you're back in the top 10 now, uh, you know, and then they keep going. And then, and then they tell me, oh, uh, anyway, uh, Rajiv, Rajiv Ram, it was so nice to meet you. <laughs> oh my God. So, That's so inappropriate. So then uh, after, you know, like 30 seconds, a minute, I don't really want to correct them because then it changes everything. And I just say, yeah, thank you very much. And I just uh. keep going because... Even Rajiv has had a lot of that where he gets my name mixed. I mean, a lot of people get mixed up. So we have a great laugh at it when we see each other. Entirely inappropriate. But I suppose if there's equal exchange of people getting you both mixed up, I think, I don't know, it certainly doesn't cancel the experience out. But yeah, that's... Uh, yeah, that's I think a, uh, because I've had the beard for a long, long time, I think by now they could have made the difference because I don't think Rajiv has ever grown his beard. <laughs> <laughs> not into the facial hair okay worst yeah. moment as an athlete uh i think the 2010 uh, u.s open loss i think uh you know with samula kureshi and uh, we lost to the uh the brian brothers i think that was the hardest hardest uh uh you know moment i, I feel as an athlete especially looking back at it now 12 years later mm -hmm. i think you know i think that uh, if he had won the title, I think a lot more, a lot uh, different uh, changes could have happened. Mm, interesting. Yeah, yeah. One activity or hobby that you enjoyed that once you retire might replace the feeling of playing tennis. Do you have something outside of tennis that you do? Uh, yeah, I love uh, uh, going, spending time at coffee shops. I have my own uh, coffee brand. So, you know, I'd love to sit in a cafe and just serve some fantastic coffee. I love it. That's amazing. That's so great. All right. And well, more, thank you. And more yeah. so if it is in New York, because it's why it's my favorite city in the world. So if I could do that, that'll be incredible. So you you want to be a barista in New York City? Is that your next step after retiring from tennis? You think? <laughs> I mean, that's a, a far far fetched goal because I don't know if my wife and daughter will be happy for me <laughs> to travel some more after my business. <laughs> Yeah, I, I believe your your wife would be like, um, you know, traveling all over the world is fine for tennis, but then if you want to serve coffee, you could probably just do that here at home in India. She would probably have something good. to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> and I think we have a good amount of population uh, drinking coffee, so I think it should be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Rohan, it's so good to connect with you. Um, you know, you and I got a chance to meet one another 
at a tennis charity event um, that was hosted by the Kings County Tennis League. It was out in the Hamptons over the summer. Super fun, right before the U.S. Open. And obviously, you know, really, really cool benefit. It's a, you know, charity that benefits a lot of the um, kids who come from disadvantaged backgrounds and uses tennis as this vehicle to um, access all these different opportunities and hopefully improve their lives. But, you know, it made me think, about what tennis has done for the both of us and probably for you because you've been playing for so long, many, many, many years after I retired. But it's pretty unbelievable if you think about all the things that tennis has offered and provided you. But when you think about that relationship, what comes to mind? Um, I think the first thing, uh, uh, Prim, is uh, like you mentioned, yes, we got a great opportunity to be part of uh, the Kings County uh, organization, you know, um, and we got to meet each other there. And I, I think that itself is an amazing thing where uh, the sport like tennis gets you to meet so many wonderful people across the world. Uh, you know, you uh, share a lot of stories coming in from different countries. Uh, you build a strong friendship over the years. So I think, you know, that is the number one thing for me. Uh, you know, I could, uh, go to about 50 plus countries today. Uh, you know, I have a friend in each corner of those countries. I mean, uh, you know, and also being able to, even if I don't have to meet them, but when I go to that country, get, uh, you know, messages or, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I have any uh, ideas for them where to go, you know, what to do, uh, you know, how to go around their city or their country and what all to see apart from the regular tourist destinations. So I think that is a family uh, which I call a home away from home, which mm -hmm. uh, you know you have built over the years. There are a lot of players I have come through from the futures challengers and now playing at the yeah, you know uh, the highest level of uh, you know tennis. So I think that is the number one thing uh, which this sport really brings is great friendship and you get to meet fantastic people. And uh, as you're growing, there's a lot more opportunities to, you know, come across different ideas, different things you can bring in from your background to, uh, you know, and how you can help the community or whether how the communicate, community can benefit from having a tennis player, you know, uh, part of their program. So I think these are, so many great aspects, uh, you know, being a tennis player and uh, getting to travel the world really, I think, encourages uh, so many wonderful things. Yeah, yeah. I think tennis is such a great connector. I mean, it's, it's not just tennis, but I mean, all sports in general. But I think what's so unique about tennis is that it is such an international and global sport. I mean, you know, you have to travel all over the country. And that's kind of different from some of the other sports that we see, uh, you know, at least here in the US, you know, football and basketball. Primarily, you're going to be traveling across the United States and not necessarily internationally. I think for for tennis, I mean, even when when you and I met, and the, because we're around the same age, I'm 41, you're 42, and just by nature of being in sport, you know, you and I connected through just like similar friends, our buddy Nick Monroe, and just, you know, doing all these different things. It's just, it's, it's, it, for me, at least, you know, it's exactly what you mentioned about just like, it's like the home away from home, but then the home is like sprinkled all over wherever you go, at least with within the confines of a tennis court and, and tennis racket. So I'm curious, do you think that whenever that time comes for you, for you to walk away from the game, do you think that's going to be the thing that you miss the most? Or do you think it's going to be maybe a bit of your... The, the physical activity, the routine, what do you think you'll miss the most? Uh, I think the miss the most is going to be, uh, you know, sh surely competing, representing your country, saying goodbye to a sport like this. You know, I want to approach a kind of a retirement like uh, the way I approached my career, to be present, to be devoted to it. Uh, you know, uh, you know, when they started off as a young kid coming, especially coming from India, uh, you know, there's a handful of people before me who have played at the highest level. So I never had access on how this journey was or what mm -hmm. it could be. 
you know, there was nobody there really to speak to or understand, you know, what were the steps. There were no mobile phones back then, or there's no social media just to send a message and, you know, find uh, somebody. So it was literally me taking one step at a time, understanding what is there ahead, yeah, you know, have, in India, they hardly, hardly showed any tennis in, uh, you know, in, in the country. So there was, uh, you know, absolutely zero idea what kind of tournaments are there, what kind of players are there. Like I said, only Wimbledon was pretty much shown, uh, you know, back then. So I was going into the sport not knowing anything. And, uh, you know, I think the strength I had was uh, truly, of course, the work ethic, like, you know, each and every player out there puts in uh, the hard work and just did it day in and day out didn't really ask questions, whatever the coaches back then knew, whatever the fitness trainers knew, uh, uh, you know, there was no uh, place to, after they said something, to go home, Google this and see if they, what they said was right or wrong. You know, you just did what was, uh, you know, told to you. And I did it religiously, constantly, uh, you know, day in, day out. Uh, and I really feel... Uh, when I went to, uh, back then, my dad took me to a few academies hoping to get like a scholarship or, uh, you know, a lot of the top academies in India, but all the academies said I was not good enough. And, uh, you know, they said, uh, unfortunately, maybe try again next year or, you know, something like that. Um, wow. And then uh, there was this academy in a city called Pune, uh, which um, there was a coach who came down to a place called Mysore, which is close to, I come from a uh, place called Kurg, which is a C, uh, spelled C-O-O-R-G. It's a hill station where primarily known for coffee plantation. We grow coffee. Hmm. Uh, you know, so I've grown up in a coffee plantation. So coffee was always there way before my tennis, uh, you know, <laughs> to that sense the coffee love, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, when, uh, when I was talking about it earlier. Uh, so I think, uh, so when this coach came over, my dad and I went and asked him, is there a chance to get a scholarship, uh, you know, at the academy uh, in Pune? Because a lot of the top tennis players back in India were playing there. Uh, so the coach said, unfortunately, I can't give him a scholarship, but he can come and join the academy, but you have to pay, you know, regular fees or whatever. So my dad said, okay, uh, you know, I was, I think maybe 14 when uh, we decided to move to a completely new city. This was, again, so new to me because I came from Kurg in this really, really small town, uh, you know, where my dad had taught himself tennis. And I feel that reading books, he had taught himself tennis and his mm -hmm. goal, his, uh, you know, uh, whatever mindset and love for the sport he had, he wanted me to try and do that. So he taught me as much as he could. And then he said, you know, you have to go to another academy. So I ended up going to Pune and uh, I was staying in one of uh, a small hostel. In a, you know, I was staying in a hostel and my dad gave me a bicycle and he said, this is your mode of transport. <laughs> so every day was about 14 to 15 kilometers. Wow. Just going in for the fitness, coming back for, uh, coming back from fitness, going to tennis, coming back from tennis. So this was just every day for good four years, four or five years, you know, and I was never a good junior. So I went to a few tournaments, never. So I was literally like this journey kid who was going around losing first round, losing qualities, you know, maybe qualifying here and there. So not really understanding, you know, where I stood, what the journey was ahead. I didn't know, you know. So it, only when I was 17, 18, I started going to a few tournaments outside India. Again, coming from India, that was another extremely hard thing is getting visas from every country. Mm. We need visas coming to every country. So I feel, so every time there's, everything is new. There was nobody there to really tell you, you know, what the process was and, you know, how everything was. I mean, today, I must say it is extremely come a long way, even though, yes, we do still need, uh, 
yeah, you know, visas for every country. But uh, for example, Europe is now, you need just a Schengen visa, you could go up to 20, 25 countries. Back then you need it for each and every country. Uh, so I feel that is, you know, this journey, looking back at it and everything, it's how I approached my journey back then. You know, I want to also look at retirement and see it and be present and then devote it as and when it happens, actually. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So really just kind of be present. But then as you were describing your journey and also being a journey player as a kid, you also mentioned, um, y- you talked about not having that blueprint and not knowing where you really stood at various points. And it sounds like tennis has giving you a sense of stability because you know where you stand. It's, it's, I mean, that's the thing that's so interesting about sport, which I think can sometimes be troublesome for athletes once we leave sport, because it's so, it's so explicit. It's so clear where we stand. We know where we're ranked. We know what tournament we're going to play next. We know what time we know if we won, we know if we lost. And obviously life is not necessarily that simple. And then the moment you get into business it's, it becomes even more confusing and more ethereal. So do you feel like some of the things that you just talked about, you will miss from tennis because it's offered you a purpose or identity or sense of stability or, or you know where you stand? I think the biggest thing I'm going to miss is having a routine. Mm. I think, you know, that is something we've always had, you know, as a... Uh, From a very young age, you know, okay, this time is your fitness. Uh, This time, you know, you have your tennis. Today, when, uh, you know, in playing your matches, you know your warm-ups. Everything is pretty much set. It's much easier. You like like exactly how you mentioned, you know, which tournament you're going to next. It's such, and for 30 weeks, maybe you're traveling for 30 weeks and you have already the calendar, you already have your plan, you have your routine. I think that is something which is going to be missed. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I think that is going to be extremely the most difficult for me, I feel. Uh, you know, because uh, I think and as every athlete out there, uh, you know, uh, we don't take this sport for granted because you don't know, you know, uh, uh, you know, what could happen next day with an injury or maybe, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, going into, uh, a place where, uh, maybe your body doesn't want to go further, but your mind, mind wants <laughs> to keep going or yeah. at times, uh, you know, the mind is done, but the body still yearns you know, to keep going. So I, I think at the end of the day, uh, I feel the body and the mind will tell me when it is the right time to really stop. Wow. So yeah. you're really kind of, you're relying on those signals emotionally, yeah. maybe spiritually, physically to tell you when. So have you thought about, you know, especially with a wife and, and daughter, have you thought about when? You would want to walk away. I mean, if you asked, uh, if we had this conversation in uh, 2019, uh, Prim, I would have said yes. To I think 2019 is pretty much done for me because uh, in the beginning of uh, 2000 or mid 2019, when I was playing a tournament in Stuttgart, um, I had a really a lot of pain on my knees. So uh, the physio there at the tournament said, "Why don't you go and do an MRI?" Uh, on my knees, you know, both my knees were pretty bad. Uh, and so I did an MRI for both my knees and then got to know that both my cartilages are fully worn out on my knees. Yeah. Wow. So that obviously answered the question of why it was hurting so much, yeah. uh, you know, with whatever I did. And uh, so till the end of the year, I was still managing with a lot of painkillers, maybe two, three painkillers a day. Wow. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, end of 2019, I told myself, is this really worth it to go again? Because, uh, you know, my, my, I'm in a lot of pain, uh, you know, but that is where I think me as a tennis player, what has really helped me is to 
maybe say, okay, let's try something different. Let's try and push something before maybe having a surgery or something. So someone said, try some PRP injections or hyaluronic injections and see how it goes. So I tried that in the end of the uh, end of the year. I tried um, those injections. When I came back in 2020, uh, beginning of uh, uh, January, I ended up winning the tournament in Doha, but I still had a lot of pain on my knees. So it wasn't like the injections were helping. So I pushed it for a few, a few more months because I spoke to a few doctors. They said it may take a little more time to just, uh, uh, you know, help or, uh, you know, just see how it goes. And then uh, in 2020 March, of course, everyone went under shutdown thanks to the, uh, you know, pandemic. Uh, you know, nobody was there. And during the uh, pandemic time, uh, I was talking to uh, one of my cousins who does yoga. And I asked her for, uh, is this something I can try? And, you know, but uh, she told me the yoga she teaches won't really work for me. So to try this yoga called the Iyengar yoga, it's a uh, type of yoga, which specializes with a lot of props, ropes, blocks and everything. So she said, I need to try that. So I tried to find out online on who's uh, teaching this and lucky enough, just couple kilometers away, there was a husband and wife uh, uh, teaching Iyengar yoga. So I called them up and I told them this is the situation. Uh, obviously, it was completely new to them because they were teaching yoga, but not to an elite athlete, uh, mm -hmm. you know, who's still trying to compete and, uh, you know, figure out, uh, you know, what the next steps were. I, you know, uh, I cannot not foresee retirement back then, you know, looking at it, but, mm. but still I said, okay, let me give this a try. I'm 40 years old, you know, uh, there's no harm in really trying, trying this out. Uh, you know, so I started going four times a week for 90 minute sessions, uh, you know, and then slowly started strengthening my quads, my hamstrings, glutes, you know, everything. And when I came back on the circuit back in September, uh, so my legs were much stronger. I lost a lot of muscle, hence there was a lot of pain. So my legs were a lot stronger, uh, thanks to the yoga I was doing, because I really couldn't do any other thing. I couldn't run, I couldn't use, I lift weights on the gym, So it, because it used to be extremely painful. Mm -hmm. And that, to be honest, changed everything. I started playing tennis again without pain, pain-free. I went from three, four painkillers to no painkillers a day you know, without, and, you know, so that gave me a different perspective onto, uh, you know, my journey. And I feel also the yoga in some way, not only uh, helped my knees, but also my entire body. I think aligning my body, calming the mind up. Yeah. Today, when I play on the, uh, when I play matches and I do everything, I feel suddenly I have a lot of time to do so many things you know, when the ball comes, I, I did not, to be honest, I did not feel that, uh, you know, back in the day when I was even playing at a prime level that I felt that everything was rushed. Hmm. Sometimes when you're playing four all five all close matches, it felt rushed and you had to do more. But today I feel that I have enough time to really see what is happening around the court and understand it. I think, I think that has helped, uh, you know, this year having, one of the best years for me for the uh, in the past five years, and I think uh, so, so, so. So, to coming back uh, uh, to the whole thing is that I yes, I see all my peers announcing, you know, like you mentioned, Nick Monroe, also a you know a really good friend, announced his retirement and everything. So, and a lot of people these days are asking me that. No, no, you know that's. <laughs> Pretty much, you know, obviously you're 42, so everybody's trying to figure out, uh, you know. Uh, but jokes apart, I think uh, uh, the biggest thing I, I told a lot of people was that when, uh, when you start this sport and you started this journey, you wanted to be playing at the highest level. Mm -hmm. So when you are playing at the highest level, when you're competing in the best, winning titles, why stop? Mm. You know, because th that many years, that many hours of hard work, commitment, everything you are putting in to get and to be at this journey. Uh, you know, so 
I don't take anything for granted. I'm, uh, uh, you know, constantly keep challenging myself on how to get, uh, stay healthy because I really feel that is the most important part. Uh, yeah, and I, the, the most difficult part surely is going to be saying goodbye to, to something which has given me, you know, my entire, my journey. This, uh, you know, tennis is such a huge, huge part of, uh, you know, my life. So, you know, yeah, uh, yeah it's definitely going to be difficult uh, saying goodbye whenever that, you know, time really comes. Yeah. You know, I don't, uh, I don't oftentimes bring a lot of active athletes onto the show. Obviously the show, as you probably see, much of it really centers around exploring who athletes are beyond sport and particularly what happens to them as they retire. But I, I really wanted to take the opportunity, of course, like I want this show to be open to really anybody, not just athletes, active, present, past, whatever, but also non-athletes too. But I was I was so curious about what this conversation would be like, because the more informed and educated about I get about this topic, it's like I'm really watching somebody like you process all of this live. And, uh, and in some ways, it brings me back to my own experiences of like, what, like, what would I say if somebody asked me about retirement? And it's funny because I, 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 the question was, when do you feel like, what signals, like, when are you going to retire? But then you, to like paraphrase in, in a nutshell, you were like, I mean, the whole point is to play at this high level. So why would you stop now? And that was your answer. And it, it's true though. And, and I highlight that not to kind of, um, but really to encapsulate like how difficult it is to walk away because that is the whole point is like for us to get to that professional, like that elite level. And when you're there, it is so much harder to walk away because you're there. And that, you know, it was funny because last week, um, a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago, I had a former Stanford and NFL wide receiver, Greg Camarillo. And he was saying, you kind of, as an elite athlete, you have to hold this like hope that my body is, even when I'm injured, I'm going to be able to recover from it. I am going to be resilient. Even when I lose, even when I don't get a shot from a team, I am somehow going to make this. But it's that same belief that makes it so much more confusing of like, well, is this going to be the time that I walk away or how about now? Or do I hold out hope? Because like what happened to you in 2019, I'm going to keep coming back. And I think, you know, you talk about some of the peers, of course, the biggest people in the name, Serena Williams, Roger Fetter, people that are your age, our age that are now walking away. We talked about Nick Monroe, a top 30 doubles player too. He is also around our age too, a um, UNC All-American. And um, he recently just announced his retirement a couple of months ago. So is it, what is it like seeing some of your peers who are your age announcing their retirement within like a several month span? I think, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, I keep saying, of course, it's uh, every individual to himself, the way, uh, you know, their journey is of and the right time for them is. I mean, if you take, for example, Roger Federer there, uh, I think the last match he played was three years ago. So he really uh, before he finally played his last match and announced his retirement. And so I think it really gave him a good amount of time to really think, think through everything. And then he came, uh, you know, even though I think everybody knew there will be, of course, a point of time where he's going to retire. But when he did announce all, including me, all those, you know, fans who were, you know, off Roger, it was heartbreaking, you know, to, yeah. you know, to, to see that, especially because I got an opportunity back in 2006 to qualify at Halle and play him in singles. Uh, you know, so, you know, uh, you know, so from then uh, and, and the way he has done so much for the sport carried himself. And, you know, I think he's a fantastic role model for, uh, you know, people older than him, younger than him, everybody. I mean, uh, you know, and uh, so Prim, the other thing is like 30 weeks we travel. 30 weeks, you know, for a lot of people, it may be something unstable when you travel and living out of a suitcase. 
but that is my rhythm hmm you know so now yeah. i need to balance and find out what is that rhythm after i stop mm-hmm. so i think when that you know someone has maybe roger sirina nick whoever you're talking about maybe they found that rhythm they found that uh, next step of what can be done or what is you know uh, their journey ahead to uh, you know and i think they decided okay this is the right time to you know uh, maybe call it a day so i think uh, uh, yeah as uh, you know i see my peers friends who everybody there uh, you know uh, announcing the retirement uh, yeah i think it's still going to be uh, like i said one day the mind the body is going to give me that signal and say you know what this is the day i think uh, you know to call it uh, call it a day does it make it in any way easier to see not only just your some of your peers retire but especially having achieved the level of success that especially Serena Williams and Roger Federer did does it make it easier to walk away i don't think it ever makes it easier i think <laughs> uh, you know i think it's extremely hard uh, you know especially if it is a great friend of yours who's you know uh uh you know walked away it's someone you're going to miss on the circuit you know you've grown yeah. so much with them i mean uh you know in some way uh you know you constantly take it for granted oh i'll see him next week I'll, you know and suddenly now you know he's announced a retirement and then everybody's younger new people coming on the circuit so that friendship also is different so yeah it it is yeah, extremely extremely hard for sure That's why because that's that's exactly what Andy Roddick mentioned. So Andy and I have known each other. We went to the same tennis academy in Florida. So we've known each other since we were 12 and 13 years old. And when I had him on the show, he mentioned that the hardest part about walking away, and he announced his retirement at 30 at the US Open in 2012, and he said the hardest thing about that whole week and day was having to tell his good friend and best friend Marty Fish. And he's he's like I couldn't even he could barely get the words out and so there's that sense of community that you were that you were talking about and so you know when i mentioned roger and serena it almost sounds like you recognize that it doesn't make it easier just because other people are doing it doesn't necessarily make it easier and so everybody kind of has it it, it sounds like you're recognizing that everybody has their own experiences and whatever other people's experiences are aren't going to be yours necessarily. Yeah, uh, absolutely very very true because you don't know what kind of emotions you're going to feel or uh you know yes you look at uh, everybody the way they have conducted themselves or where they have gone about it but at that moment sometimes you don't know you know how how those emotions are how we, how you're going to feel or where you are in the world that you know this day is going to come or we're going to announce and you know sometimes you may be plan for it saying okay this could be the tournament i want to uh, call it a day but you don't know whether you're going to even reach that tournament or not so you know so you don't know what your plans are uh, you know uh, especially playing a sport uh, you know which is so physical and you don't know so you just have to take it i think uh, day by day and uh, you know hope that uh, you know whatever you are looking for or whatever uh, you plan ahead falls into place the right way mhm mhm you know when you were mentioning about just the synergy between the mind body spirit and all that other stuff and and it sounds like in 2019 and also 2020 that pandemic was kind of a big blessing in disguise for you because you got to really you got to take a break i think your knees needed it for me i've had two surgeries on my knees so i mean just sheer rest can really really be helpful and uh, i'm curious about what you've uh, if you've gotten a chance to hear what juan martin del potro has said recently he was talking to an argentine publication um over the past month or so and you know for those that don't follow the game of tennis you know juan martin former us open champion former top 5 player in the world and has been around for for many many years but he shared his struggles about around retirement which he did earlier this year and he said 
that, um, you know, he mentioned, quote, I was, I was number three in the world until suddenly I broke my knees and here I am with nothing. When you hear him say, here I am with nothing, what are your thoughts about how he described his experience? I, definitely heartbreaking. I mean, uh, you know, because uh, one day you're on top of the world, uh, you know, you're uh, uh, especially coming from a country like Argentina, which, you know, has had fantastic football players, uh, you know, and today you have another sport doing really well. And I think Juan Martin uh, is one of those tennis players, uh, you know, who has uh, inspired so many people and, uh, you know, uh, he was just a young guy just coming up, getting this all the success, won a Grand Slam at the US Open and, uh, you know, uh, and he was a, a fantastic guy off the court as well. And I think that that kind of also really helped, uh, you know, for the people to, uh, you know, really love him as a player. And I think uh, overnight when he had that kind of injury, uh, Yes, you try everything because as a tennis player, I think you're taught from a young age to find a solution, uh, you know, and constantly find ways to get uh, what is the next stage or to do better, uh, you know. So I'm sure, you know, he has tried everything there is, you know, to, to find a way. He did try to come back. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's when, when you have no plan, when you have... Yeah, you know, a lot of time your mind just really starts wandering all over the place and it's extremely difficult. And you know that, uh, uh, you know, when especially when you had those surgeries and you're sitting there, you know, there's so much of time, uh, you know, it, it's about who you surround yourself with. I think really, really makes a difference of, you know, having that positivity, having good people around you. Uh, so so I think, you know, it surely, surely has been heartbreaking and it's, uh, yeah, I haven't heard his interview, but I can really imagine, mm -hmm. I mean, what the hardships he has been through, uh, you know, to come to a level where he is and then, you know, today not be able to even play anywhere close to, you know, that kind of level or even play on the tennis court. Uh, yeah, so I think... Uh, uh, as we, as we spoke about earlier, I mean, we can't take anything for granted. We just have to take it as it comes and, uh, you know, just enjoy the moments, uh, you know, which you have had for so many years, enjoy that friendships you have built over the years. And I think, uh, um, uh, you know, for me, what does I think really help is, uh, my wife is a psychologist. So indirectly mm -hmm. somewhere, I feel she has played a huge part, um, you know, in a lot of those tough times you go through, you know, when you're yeah. not feeling well, not, you know, just to the way she communicates. I think, you know, I, I tell her, you know, I've known people for many, many years, but she meets them maybe twice, thrice. She knows more and more about <laughs> them than I would have known for so long. It's, so it's just, uh, yeah. It, it's just something amazing. So I think, uh, uh, you know, a lot of credit, you know, even to her and my journey, who, you know, uh, to the way I've shaped my career on and off the court also, I think, uh, you know, a lot comes from her uh, bringing that energy and, uh, yeah. and, you know, I think so, the, the, uh, like I said, it's just having the right people around you makes a huge difference. Yeah. I, yeah. I remember you when we first met and you mentioned that your wife was a psychologist. I was like, oh my God, that's so cool. I'm like, I now I definitely have to have you on the show because I just think that, I think that it does make a difference. You know, you probably, the conversations are probably a little bit different. You do notice her ability to connect and connect quickly with people. And I think it is just different. Like when you're communicating with somebody who is what we call psychologically minded, it kind of opens up your world in a completely different way. And so I would imagine that, you know, just knowing that she is there and she continues to be there and she will also be there whenever that time comes for you from you to walk away that you can kind of lean on her to just be there to support you and and maybe um help you navigate through some of those challenging times whenever that happens 
I, I truly, Prim, I think it, I think it makes a huge difference. And uh, uh, to, gi- to give you a little uh, insight on uh, her perspective is that the fact she did not even watch tennis before we got, you know, married. <laughs> you know, so everything was new to her. So when she brings in a perspective, it is completely non-tennis uh, related. Mm-hmm. So I think that kind of really helped. Uh, you know, uh, because she was not there really saying, oh, you missed this forehand, you should have hit it this way, or, you know, you should have served it to his backhand, or, for example, she came from a different, completely different angle. And I think that really made a difference, uh, you know, and helped me in uh, terms of my partnerships also, and maybe how I could communicate with, uh, you know, a lot of partners on how it will work and, you know, what can make a, make a difference. So indirectly, I feel somewhere... Uh, you know, it stayed with me, you know, those thoughts of just, you know, having uh, her traveling with me and, uh, you know, she sacrificed a few years uh, of her journey to travel with me, to build our uh, marriage, have that strong relationship, uh, you know, so because um, unfortunately for me, there was no work from home opportunity at this point. <laughs> we can't really do that. So I think yeah. I'm very thankful to her that she sacrificed and, uh, you know, traveled with me a lot, understood also what this journey needs and how this journey is, uh, you know, uh, the tennis store goes to pretty much the same cities year in, year out. Uh, you know, today, today I tell her she travels to only the cities she likes. It's not more... <laughs> You know? yeah. so I think, uh, <laughs> that's great yeah. and she should feel that way she's like yeah, she, i mean you're gone 30 weeks out of the year she should yeah. i mean she doesn't have to go 30 weeks and she can't because she's working and you're you correct. have a daughter correct. so correct. yeah well yeah. now i have to ask what i'm so curious what kinds of things has she she told you from a uh at least from the mind of a novice as a tennis player but you, you know, and this is for me coming at it from a clinical perspective, like you don't have to know the game or you don't know have you don't have to know about sport oddly um, to know how to maximize performance. So what kinds of things has she shared with you that's been not only important to your game, but also maybe preparing you for the transition from tennis? I think in the uh, this is going to be a tenth year uh, of our marriage, and uh, I don't think there's been one day where I've just sat across the room and just told her, "This is what I'm talking about. Give me some perspective." You know, mm-hmm. it is just during a conversation happening, she'll maybe bring it up, and subconsciously it sits sits in my mind. I think obviously she she knows me very well on where to really bring up, uh, you know, what kind of. Uh, uh, you know, topic, uh, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I'm a hard critic on myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, uh, so sometimes I'll be talking about the match on what I could have done better or what this. So that is where I think she's at times plays the bigger person to understand, uh, you know, what are the good things that also happened during that, during that match or during that period? You know, of the way, uh, yes, uh, as tennis players, we look at only the minute details of where it could have been better or what can be done, but never really look at all the amazing things what has happened in that match. Uh, you know, so not, like I said, not tennis coaching, but just the way my body language was or the way I was walking or whatever it may be, uh, you know, and also uh, at times of, when I communicated with uh, the partner, it should have been maybe uh, in a different way. If I told her, this is how I mentioned something to him. Uh, so she would say, okay, you know, why don't you try it in this way? Uh, you know, and see if this, this works or it gets, you know, gets <laughs> conveyed better to, you know, mm-hmm. in a way. So, so then it, you know, I sit back and think, oh yeah, that, that could be the, uh, maybe the better way or, uh, you know, what I did was probably not the right uh, way to go about it. So, uh, so yeah, so not, like I said, it's not never really sat, sat that down and said, okay, you know what, I need a session here today. So indirectly, <laughs> I think in a, in a lot, uh, uh, um, many ways, it probably has worked, but never really as a personal psychologist or anything. Sure. Yeah. 
you know, there would be a lot of conflict of interest there and probably a lot of marital <laughs> issues as well. Yeah. Is, uh, uh, you know, I don't think she, she would do that, uh, you know, for sure. Yeah, my husband definitely doesn't want to be psychoanalyzed, nor do I really want to. That's just, that's <laughs> that's for my clients. But I mean, it is so, I mean, gosh, the, when you said that tennis players, we focus on the the smallest detail and always the detail of what we did wrong, because that's how you get good. But even many years after I retired, like it's, it is actually like a problem. It is it is what allows me to achieve so much success in life, but it is also like the thing that makes me feel miserable sometimes because I'm so hard on myself. Um, but but you're right though about what your wife's perspective of like, yeah, it's like let's let's balance this out. Yes, you can be hard on yourself and you can focus on the things that you can improve on. But you can also focus on the things that you did well, and it's okay to do that. And so it sounds like maybe even when that time comes for you to retire. Rather than focusing on all the bad, my body falling apart, this is time is over, this feels awful, you are also able to kind of like savor and appreciate this experience along the way and like all the gifts that it offered you. Does it feel, am I kind of processing yeah, that absolutely. right? I think you have a spot on there. I, you know, I think uh, uh, it, it, it all comes together with, you know, uh, everybody playing such a huge part in your journey. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, you know, I think speaking to the right people because tennis, yes, is an individual sport, but there are so many wonderful people around that athlete, which makes that journey, you know, go in the right direction also. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think at the end of the day, when uh, today I have a tennis academy here in Bangalore and I really feel I can give back a lot uh, in terms of not just tennis coaching, but just the journey ahead. I mean, which I did not have. And I really feel if some kid came to me, I can tell them, you know, what the journey looks like or how difficult or how easy or whatever it may be. But at the end of the day, uh, it has to come from within. It has to come from within themselves on how much they really believe it. I mean, no matter which academy in the world you go, I think it has to come, you know, from the parents and the uh, kids themselves, uh, you know, to really believe that this is the journey they want to really take. And uh, yeah, so I think uh, when it comes to the day of call, uh, you know, calling it quits, I think uh, speaking to all the you know people around me, uh, I think also gives a great perspective uh, you know, for you making that call also. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I remember you mentioning that you do, you have your own tennis Academy. You mentioned your interest and passion and coffee, obviously your family. And, you know, we, we, you said that routine is going to be the hardest thing to, to replace and athletes. I mean, it, it's just across the board. It's the one thing that a lot of athletes and also veterans too, and members of the military, that's because there's this built in schedule and structure. It's so nice to lean on that. Like, you know, exactly where to be, where to go at nearly every minute and every hour of every day. So when you do retire, what do you think your routine will look like? And, and what would you like to fill it up with? I think that one of the reasons I started my academy was only because of this. I started seven years ago because I really wanted to have at least that place where I could go. Mm. You know, I mean, I, when I stopped, uh, you know, maybe, yes, I'm doing a few other uh, businesses as well, but still, you know, have this place where tomorrow I can say, you know, wake up, go. Yes, the kids are waiting there. You know, um, I'm happy to go to the academy, do something there and then take it forward from there. Because I obviously speaking to a lot of uh, friends, peers, everyone, um, you know, who have stopped. Uh, <laughs> then they said it takes them good six, eight months to understand what's happening. So by then your mind is just overthinking everything and trying to figure out what's happening and, uh, you know, what are the next steps. Uh, so I think I have uh, not only my family, but I have a good team who's managing me, who are uh, making me understand that journey of, you know, what are the next steps? What are the other stuff available? Uh, I think tennis will still be a huge part of my life. I mean, you know, whether tomorrow it's academy or maybe, 
uh, you know, whether it could be commentary, whether whatever it could be, but I think tennis will still be huge, huge, uh, you know, part of, uh, yeah, you know, my career, I feel I don't want to, uh, you know, completely go away from it. And, uh, you know, whether I even get to travel to maybe watch a few matches, uh, you know, watch the Grand Slams or, you know, a few Masters series, uh, you know, I would still love to do that because travel again is also something which is, uh, you know, been such a great part of, uh, you know, my journey. So these couple of things I would love to still have, uh, uh, you know, but I, I'm not really jotted it down to be say, okay, mm -hmm. this is it. Uh, you know, I'm happy uh, if I open a coffee shop, even going there from nine to four, uh, you know, as long as I know Monday to Friday, okay, this is kind of my routine. Not waking mm -hmm. up on Monday thinking, oh, what am I doing today? Then, what am I, you know, so I felt, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, that when the pandemic happened and you're sitting at home, yeah. And nothing really to do. Your mind is just constantly active, trying to figure out what, uh, you know, what really to do. I think what really helped was uh, we had a daughter in 2019. So that <laughs> took the mind off in, in, a, in a big, big way that, uh, you yeah. know, having around and, you know, your date kind of just goes much quicker, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> it, do, it definitely does. Yeah. So she was around one year yeah, old she was at that just, point. Just about uh, uh, May, she turned, uh, she was born 2019 May. So she was not in one when the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's a good time to be available for kids because that's when, that's how old our little guy Tyson is. He's 14 months right now. And so, I mean, he's just grabbing and crawling and trying to walk and knocking his head on things. You really have to be there for the kids in every way possible so that that certainly that kept you busy it sounds like yeah absolutely i think it gave uh, and uh, during that time my wife was extremely busy so i think uh, she was yeah. working, she was only one uh, you know working a lot during the, <laughs> the pandemic because uh, and no one else really had work but i think uh, uh, a lot of the psychologists were on demand and a lot of people needed their help so she was busy so it was nice to you know, be around uh, and give her that little break uh, as well, uh, you know, from um, all the majority of the time she spends with her daughter, you know, when I'm traveling, yeah. uh, being away. For some of the tennis players, we, we've, we've lost, I want to say lost, um, at least from a tennis perspective. I mean, Serena and Roger and uh, the Juan Martin, the Potros and the Nick Monroe's of the world. I mean, they'll, they'll always be around and that will be fun to watch them as they kind of go into the next chapter of their lives. But from a tennis perspective, we had to say goodbye to a lot of them. What do you hope for them as they leave the game of tennis? Uh, I think still very much be part of the, part of the sport in some way. I think uh, they have changed the sport and helped the sport in many many ways i mean uh, you know to add to the list also were the brian brothers uh, you know retired yeah. a few years ago and uh, you know they have done so many wonderful things to the sport not only on the tennis court but off the tennis court as well uh, you know so it'll be really amazing to have them continue with you know what they have uh, done for the sport and really help build the sport because uh, you know i think uh, tennis is such a global sport i mean uh, uh, not only uh, even you're playing the sport, you're, you're traveling different cities, different countries, different surfaces, different, uh, you know, tennis balls and different events because it depends which company is sponsoring the tennis ball. So it's, there's so many variables and you know, to all this. And despite all that, these guys have achieved so much, I mean, you know, and done so much and all their fans across the globe. So I think, It'll be nice to really have them also, uh, you know, be part of uh, tennis in some way, whether it is, uh, uh, you know, coming to the tournaments, uh, you know, even I think just having them around, a lot, lot of the people get inspired just, you know, watching them there, you know. So I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think so I'd love to, you know, see that, that they do, uh, uh, you know, be seen in uh, all these places and I think, uh, uh, you know, share. Uh, so many of their journeys, you know, and talk about it. I think, you know, there'll be many, many young uh, uh, kids there who'd love to listen and their parents also love to listen to their journey and, uh, you know, 
understand and what it really takes coming in from uh you know from the US from Switzerland from Argentina whether you know so mm-hmm. and still and still playing this uh, this sport everybody coming together but having different journeys across uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know from the global, uh, uh, different parts of the world yeah so it sounds like you almost wish that even if they are ending their athletic careers but you hope that they don't necessarily have to say goodbye entirely to the game of tennis because that relationship like you can still be involved in different ways and i think and we kind of saw that in Roger Federer's uh retirement and goodbye letter i forgot what the last line was i actually made a social media post about it but he kind of said and to the game of tennis i love he said something like you know this is not goodbye forever or you know he basically yeah. alluded to the idea that I'm not really saying goodbye. It's just, you know, the, the relationship is going to change and there's that acknowledgement. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, one of the uh, examples is Stefan Edberg, who I always looked up to. I, I would, I didn't in my wildest dreams think that I would get to meet him, you know, and not only meet him, uh, in 2011, I was playing doubles with Isam Hulak Qureshi from Pakistan and uh, we were playing against Roger Federer and, uh, and Stanislas Wawrinka and Edberg was coaching Roger back then. Uh-huh. So he had to sit in the box to watch the match. And I, I, I don't think in my wildest dreams, I thought first meeting Edberg, I didn't think he'd be sitting and actually watching me play. So, you know, <laughs> so, you know so, I, I mean, just similarly, I feel when, you know, you have these guys come back, you know, who knows, you know, the, somebody who has started tennis watching these players tomorrow they mm-hmm. happen to see them live it just makes that much more uh an experience so much more better for everybody out there mhm so then my last and then my next question would be what do you want for yourself when that time comes to walk away from the game of tennis one that you love so much I would love uh you know to share this entire journey experiences I've had to uh, you know and talk about it you know in many places talk uh, as long as uh you know I'm happy to uh be a person who somebody get access to have the access come and talk to me I don't want to be someone you know who who's out there who's gone through this but having the most difficult time to understand what a journey is i want them to come to me reach out to me talk to them i want to be involved uh you know in really helping the growth of the sport here in india mm. i feel we have a really uh amazing ability uh in terms of uh picking up uh the sport but just not having a structure in place where you know i really feel i could be a big guidance of help uh, you know a lot of people think uh, especially when you voice your opinion they don't really want want you to be part of that uh, uh, you know journey but i really feel that is where the change will happen yeah. uh, you know tennis they've been fantastic juniors but never really gone up to the senior level and i really feel that is where as an athlete if you can come in and share your journeys and help these younger kids to the next step whether it is going to college mm-hmm. tomorrow or going pro uh, you know someone just talking to them uh, giving them the right perspective uh, you know and that is where i really want to feel uh, that i can give back to the sport and really help uh, you know tennis players from india or maybe across the globe well it certainly sounds like you have a tremendous pa- passion to giving back to your community in india because it gave so much to you and that's where it all began so and and that's great it sounds like you've really planted the seeds for your next chapter and as we kind of just wrap things up i appreciate you so much just coming on and and getting to know you more getting to know more about your athletic and personal journeys but i'm curious if if the questions that we uh that i posed today and that we explored have you talked about these things before i'm just curious what what the experience was because it's not often that we talk with an active player and they're like wow we're talking so much about retirement right now like is this something that i really want to do i don't think uh, publicly i i have mm-hmm. i have uh, you know i think this may be the first first time i'm actually 
speaking so much about it you know yeah. otherwise like i said everybody talks about it and it's just maybe 30 seconds a minute and then it's done you know <laughs> but the yeah, uh, uh yes just talking about it also suddenly my mind is thinking yeah what what uh, what are the things you know is it is it really uh, something uh you know what i'm going to do or what's happening yeah. it's it, it's constantly now playing in my head also of course yeah that is so interesting and the reason why i asked that is because you know in some of the research that i am doing i you know my whole aim as i'm going through this uh my doctoral program is really to create a program kind of like a curriculum and program and also service for athletes but maybe veterans as well or anybody else as they're going through a transition because and the reason why i wanted to bring you on is like because no one really did that for me when I was playing tennis. I mean, there's always that thing of like, okay, what do you want to do? But no one really talked about like, hey, I just want to give you a heads up. Like this thing, you're going to have to say goodbye to this game that you love so much. And no one ever talked about that relationship. And so I think even just having a conversation and then for you sharing your experiences and opening up for others to hear about what it's going to be like and also get some ideas about like, what is my next chapter going to look like? I mean, that that's, this is what it should feel like. This is what it should be like. It might be confusing. It might be even just like cumbersome. You're like, I don't really have all those answers, but that, you know, I, I appreciate you coming on and just being so brave and like even being able to talk about it. Cause it's, it's not an easy topic. No, I think, uh, Prim, uh, really thank you for doing that. Uh, because I feel, uh, it's, uh, you know, maybe sitting in a session when somebody's really asking you something and, you know, you coming out and really thinking about that. And, uh, you know, like you mentioned, I don't think there's anyone out there who really talks about uh, this or makes you even think, okay, uh, you know, sh- how I sh- should plan about it or how I should go about it, uh, you know. So uh, it's amazing uh, that you're doing this. And I think uh, mm-hmm. so many yeah. wonderful people uh, will benefit, uh, you know, even uh, listening. Uh, you know, to all the wonderful, uh, yeah, people you have had on the show, and uh, uh, you know, so uh, even for me, like I said, it's the first time uh, talking uh, publicly about it. So it's, it's so it's nice, nice in a way when, uh, and I'm sure I'm looking forward uh, to hearing myself on, you know, what I really <laughs> said, and uh, uh, you know, and then understanding whether what uh, you know I should do or I shouldn't do going ahead. No, I mean, it's, it's all, it's all, it's all authentic. And that's the most important thing. And, you know, thank you for coming on the show. Wish you the best of luck every single tournament, you know, that you're going to be playing in for the next, however many months and years and, you know, enjoy the ride. And then also, you know what, maybe you should drop a little, some plans for, for Rohan's, your coffee shop in New York city, right by maybe like Midtown where, you know, everybody always stays, the players and media always stays for the U S open. That could be like your, that could be your target audience. I mean, the, the audience already there because I've constantly given them coffee beans when I'm traveling. I've constantly <laughs> traveled. So they already know that that uh, part of uh, my site. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I should maybe uh, sit down and uh, look at it. <laughs> really uh, Midtown Manhattan is definitely the right, right spot to be at. Yeah. All right. Well, whenever that happens and whenever you open, I want the invitation. But Rohan, thank that. you so much. <laughs> the, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Brim. Thank you so much for having me. And, uh, you know, really wonderful you're doing this. Thanks a lot. My hope is that you got a glimpse of what a conversation could sound and look like in preparing an athlete for their transition from sport. Rohan is right and that these types of conversations typically happen in passing or they're just avoided altogether or pushed aside and not given the time and energy it deserves. And understandably so, because as a professional or elite athlete, your job is not to prepare for the end. It is to prepare for the next game or match or tournament. But, but it is also important to point out that just because you are thinking of what you will do next does not mean you're not dedicated to sport. Those things don't have to be mutually exclusive. You can still be committed to your craft as an athlete while preparing for the future in your next chapter. 
Really hope you enjoyed today's conversation. For more episodes, you can visit our homepage on iHeartRadio or wherever you get your podcasts. And also to watch the full version of these interviews, you can head on over to YouTube to search for the next chapter with Prim Saripapat. Subscribe to us, like us, give us a star rating. We really appreciate you listening and showing your support. The next chapter with Prim Saripapat is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.